Jeff, did you watch wrestling this week? Ian, you know, I have a life outside of this. Oh, I'm sorry. I should not have uh, pushed the topic. Uh, or pushed but Yeah, the- I watched a lot of wrestling because I, I don't really have <laughs> much going on in that life. So. No. <laughs> and it was a good week to watch the wrestling, too. It was a fantastic week. And it's... I, I figured out there's been no AEW shows, no New Japan Pro Wrestling shows mm-hmm. between uh, this and the last time we did a podcast. It's been mm-hmm. all WWE and it's been all good. Yeah, they are. They're they're in their traditional like, like, you know, trench in the Death Star. Yeah, that they get to leading up to WrestleMania. WrestleMania being the exhaust port mm-hmm. that was of course put there by Jinder So's father as a deliberate act of sabotage and for no other reason. Right. And it um, uh, this is where WWE is their best. These two weeks, yeah. WWE never fails to yeah. make a I mean, good build. Yeah, because this is always a everything leads towards this moment type of deal. Mm-hmm. Whereas elsewhere throughout the year, you know, even at SummerSlam, you have some angles that aren't concluding at SummerSlam. Mm-hmm. WrestleMania, yeah. it all ends at WrestleMania. So it's a like a very focused and everything feels big and important. And you're right. Like it is good every year. But I think this year it's been a little bit better. Um, actually, I would say a lot better. Due to the inclusion of one Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I think The Rock has a, has a very big part in that. But I also think that the company's just really hot and they were they were getting really hot before uh, before The Rock came back. I mean, they've been hot since the yeah. bloodline angle took off. Like that was a long time ago. It um, was this weird it, little crossover where like a lot of people heard about the Vince McMahon thing and they were like, that's crazy. And then they're like, I haven't really watched in a while. And then they watched and they're like, it's pretty good. Well, actually, if you look at the numbers, like if you look at when the ratings started to go up a little bit or or the, the bigger thing is the attendance. Like they, they're, they're getting, I mean, they had 15,000 people there on Monday, like their attendance is, and I think they put up a graphic. They're on like their 11th mm-hmm. straight sellout for TV, but that actually started when Vince McMahon quote unquote retired the first time. Yeah. And triple H came in. And I think a lot of people kind of said, well, I want to see what the WWE looks like without Vince. And I think they kept a lot of those fans because, mm. you know, I, I think everything that was going on with Roman is really cool. And a lot of those fans that I think that have, have come back uh, are particularly stoked that the rock has come back. Now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm particularly stoked that now we are getting the meat and potatoes, vicious and cruel heel rock. Like, you yeah. know, the rock rock concerts are great and Rudy, Rudy poos and all that. We all love it, but when The Rock gets mean, mm-hmm. oh, he gets so mean. And we've been living in Dwayne Johnson's world for so long mm-hmm. that we've kind of forgotten what that Rock was like. You know, oh, man. The, and to when see Rock, it, when Rock first started to get hot, like you, you remember wrestling was so oh, yeah. like wrestling was huge, right? Um. Mainly because like the NWO had had uh-huh. caused like a big boom in the business, and Austin had gotten hot mm-hmm. at the same time. So, but at the same time as Austin got hot, Rock is starting to kind of win over some fans who originally mm-hmm. were not into the Rock at all. Because when the Rock first came in, he was Rocky yeah. Maivia. He was just a complete copy of Rocky Johnson. And we now know from Young Rock. Rocky Johnson is awesome, and we all should have loved that uh, gimmick when he did it. But we didn't know, so we didn't. We lacked the <laughs> context. But then when he came in and he was a heel, mm-hmm. and he joined the Nation of Domination, Ugh. that's when the catchphrases started to come out. And, you know, I think he leaned into the trash talking he had learned at the I University think, of Miami. I think that, too, was one of the last... Uh, that comes to mind anyway, uh, segments that featured gifting a giant picture of yourself to someone <laughs> and then then being upset when they didn't like it. Oh, that was classic. So this was, if you don't remember, mm-hmm. uh, or you weren't friggin' alive when it Let's happened. Let's hop in the way back machine. Too. 
Um, so this was, they did this whole angle where Farouk was the leader of the nation of domination, but rock was this cocky young upstart who's getting more attention. He's becoming more popular. And mm -hmm. so they're teasing that the, the rock is going to usurp Farouk. And so yeah. they had some, some it was like segment Farouk the, appreciation night or Farouk something. Farouk appreciation yeah. night or something where the whole nation was in there and the rock bought them all gifts and the rocks gift to Farouk was a picture of the rock. But not just like like an eight by 10 with like two <laughs> Farouk, keep it real, Rocky. You know, I'm talking like this was a a poster sized four foot by two foot massive picture of the rock in a frame. It was framed. It looked very nice, but it was like a big piece. It wasn't as great as the Festival of Friendship painting because nothing is, but this was close. And that was when, like, he would deliver what would eventually become his catchphrases. But at the time, it was just stuff that he said. Like, the first time, <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time he said, if you smell what I'm cooking. Me too. Uh, it was in my basement, WrestleMania. <laughs> he was, well, like, WrestleMania was on TV in my basement. It was not held in my basement. No, uh, WrestleMania was on your TV in the basement. That's right. It was on the TV. Often. Yeah. Yes. Um, it wasn't until years later when I went to a WrestleMania that I realized the difference. It's like, oh, this is live. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Ian's All mom's right. bringing us fewer <laughs> lemonades. Um, I don't know if I like yeah, this. Yeah, he, he had just said uh, in an interview, like, like just off the cuff, like, there's something you would normally say. It was just like, if you smell what I'm cooking. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then it was like people, you know, they would see that people like had caught on to that. And then it to now where he yells it at the top mm -hmm. of his lungs at the end of every promo. He did have that brief period, too, where it took him about 45 minutes to say it, mm -hmm. where he, he extended the smell. And there was a lot well, there of there was like pauses. la 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 la's for a while. Yeah. Like if you remember the la 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 phase of the mm -hmm. if you smell la 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 what the rock is cooking. Yeah. Um, I don't believe the la la la's have continued, but they were there no. at one point. Yes. Well, he's, he's older now, you know, <laughs> you have fewer la la la's as you get older. It's just, just the nature, you know? Um, but like you were saying, we've got, we've got that rock now back, mm -hmm. back in WWE. And I actually thought that because when they were in Memphis for SmackDown and he did the rock concert, that was, he was a pure baby face. Yeah. Um, but I think the reasoning there is that because the rocks early career, he wrestled in Memphis and he's always, yeah. well, he, he always does those things in Memphis. So he's got a bit of a connection with the city. So it's like, whatever, just be a baby face. Cody isn't even there that night. Mm -hmm. Um, but this was on raw. He was a strict heel. Oh yeah. So let me just run you through, uh, my, you know, what right. happened on Monday night through the lens of Ian. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so Cody comes out. Cody does a great promo because Cody always does great promos because yeah, Cody Rhodes Cody. is really good at wrestling. I'm good at wrestling. Wrestling. All aspects yeah. of wrestling. You narrate. I'll, I'll be the, the characters in the back. <laughs> so he does his promo and the raw, and then all of a sudden the rocks music hits and no one's advertised the rock. We did not know he was going to be there. But it's a huge crowd. It's 15,000 people in there to see CM Punk talk. <laughs> and so The Rock comes out with, and his entrance now with the lightning bolts and things like that just makes it seem like he is a deity that has come out of the, the heavens have opened up and provided you The Rock. Rocky be praised. <laughs> and so he comes out and they just stare at each other for a bit and they say nothing nothing he doesn't get on the mic he doesn't do anything he just but he comes over to cody and he whispers something in his ear and if you if you go back and watch his mouth to see what he whispered which i'm sure much time on your hands <laughs> i did it and how is the lip says, reading class <laughs> he says to cody well, well this has been verified like if you go online other other people have, have done the same thing, too. Um, hmm. There's more of you. So if lots of people online agree with you, then <laughs> you're right. And right. you shouldn't let anybody else tell you otherwise, because you've been validated. Makes sense anyway. to me. 
so anyway, the, the rock says, what the rock said to Cody was tonight. I'm going to make you bleed. Oh, and if you'd figured that out initially, you'd be like, what? But then something very cool happened to WWE programming later on in the show. We'll get to that. So then later at the, the end of the main event, Cody oh, look, is we're here now. <laughs> Cody and Seth and the babyface team. I mm. can't remember who it was. Cody, Seth, and Jay Uso. Jay Uso. Jay so they're Uso. they're they're fighting uh, off the, the bloodline. And we've all been led to believe that the rock left the building, right? Like they said, um, like Jackie Redmond tried to get an interview with him before he left the building. So we're we've been led to believe he's yes. not there anymore. But he's as gone. Cody's He's gone. He's got stuff to do. He's got stuff to do. He's got tequila to sell. Right? And many, many other things to sell. Tequila and, and energy drinks and lotion. And hmm. he's got big Dwayne energy. He does um, have big Dwayne energy, yes. So they're fighting in the back. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the rock attacks Cody. And they brawl in the back and into the parking lot for... God, if felt like a good 10 minute segment i have no mm. idea how long it was but that's that's how long it felt <laughs> so <laughs> and at one point they did a lot of like subtle advertising here did they like, hit the clangy poles what the clangy poles what are the clangy poles yeah in every backstage altercation there's a big thing of clangy poles that they oh get yeah into, no so. that, that's like white noise to me during oh, the okay. backstage <laughs> brawl. like i i'm not gonna notice that like <laughs> did they punch each other during the brawl like i assume so <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those things that I note. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so they go out to the, the parking lot and the camera zooms in on the rock talking uh, right while you can see this advertisement for a brand of vodka that I think is being sponsored or is sponsoring Cody right now. Oh, cool. And, <laughs> no, it was like the most obvious bit of like advertising. But anyway, <laughs> uh, and during this brawl, the rock makes Cody bleed and this wasn't like, like this was, he gigged, gigged his head. The hard uh, way. This, yeah, this was. Or like, the easy way. The, so this is a big shift for WWE now, because for the longest time they were like, nope, no blood. It, mm -hmm. it, it's a policy. It seemed like some people were dancing around that policy. Like there I think has been like, blood from time to time. Like certain exceptions were made. And obviously yeah. there's going to be accidents too, but. You know. But there was this case at SummerSlam where Brock Lesnar was wrestling yeah. Randy Orton, and <laughs> the idea was, <laughs> wrestling. like, I'm gonna he open assaulted him. Up. him. <laughs> I'm gonna open him up hard way, which means you're gonna elbow him in the head until he bleeds. But they couldn't quite get it to work, and so Lesnar ends up just straight elbowing Randy Orton in the head for an uncomfortable amount of time. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, Chris Jericho very famously talks about that because he almost yeah, ran Chris down to Jericho, the ring to legit fight Lesnar over it yeah. because he didn't know what was going on. Yeah, well, and shit, for Chris you know, Jericho like, to be like, "I'm going to go fight Brock Lesnar for real," stuff had to be hitting the fan. Well, that's I mean that's consistent for Jericho. Jericho has picked fights with uh, Goldberg, Brock Lesnar. He, yeah, uh, but you know what? Jericho would would destroy Goldberg. Well, yeah, Brock Jer Lesnar. Hey, man, Jer I don't know. Jericho <laughs> trained with the hearts, kind of not really. If you read his book, <laughs> yeah. But anyways, <laughs> fewer legit fights in the fake sport. The Rock makes Cody bleed. Okay, so the Rock's make the Rock makes Cody bleed, and this is something that I remember. I listened to an interview that Nick Khan did where he was like, yeah, we, we are discussing if it's possible to sort of do that in the third hour or on pay-per-view when mm -hmm. like, it's not a big deal for the sponsors. Uh, because of course, yeah. a, 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 like Vince McMahon went after AEW's use of blood relentlessly. Yeah. In the first uh, arena you're... match too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where the term blood and guts come from is Vince mm -hmm. McMahon uh, was like, Oh, we're, you know, we're none of this blood and guts like this other company or something like that. Yeah, we've learning. never done anything like that. <laughs> and then there was an issue where, if you remember, Nick Gage wrestled Chris Jericho. Yeah. 
And at one point he took a pizza cutter and was running it over Chris Jericho's head mm-hmm. as one does. But when cutting pizza it was on like, someone's face. Like it was, there was picture in picture going on and a mm-hmm. Domino's advertisement came yes, up. Yes, I remember that, yeah. And so everybody was like, well, that's funny, right? And I think it was actually Domino's Michael was Che. Like, no. <laughs> I think it was actually Michael Che from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> who like tweeted something out to like get it started. <laughs> That's amazing. And then later Domino's released a statement saying, we join the voices issuing concern over this thing, which made no sense because yeah. nobody else which had essentially uh, had means made... whatever the most popular people are saying, <laughs> we agree with this too. I agree with the most important executive in the room. Yes, um, exactly. So it made no sense unless they'd been contacted by so- someone saying, hey, all these people are complaining about AEW's use of mm-hmm. blood and guts. So anyway, yeah. that's a thing yeah. they were doing. But I mean, <laughs> as they moved into the PG era, WWE scaled back all that stuff, and it just never yeah. kind of came back. Um, but yeah. and I wonder how much this has to do with sort of testing the waters with the audience because they don't care if they piss off the network. They're leaving the network in eight months. Yeah, they're like, going to Netflix. Like, you know, you think like they're, they're so, you can bleed all you want on Netflix. So I know? think maybe they might be seeing how far they can push things with the audience on a weekly basis because yeah. you don't want to alienate that family money because that's, that's the right. real money. But you also now are looking at these like you mentioned, fans that had come back after a while who are more mm-hmm. used to seeing stuff like that. Yeah. And so if you're kind of not doing it, they're like, what's, what's going on with wrestling? You know, this seems very watered down and weird. And yeah. Yeah. Still, I, you know, I think so. I think that this is kind of one of those things they're like, let's see if we can do the bleeding thing here. Let's see if we can do that there. You know, I, I do think this was a testing of the, of the waters uh, because this happened right like after 11 p.m. Right. Like this was in the overrun, the very end of the show. So this is 11 p.m. So they they're like, kids aren't watching this. Right. Like, yeah. you know, and uh, if it's the case where like a lot of parents, they'll watch wrestling with their kids, but like they're watching it much later. Yeah. And in some cases, well, young their kids brother just has said, way. hey, That's don't it. watch this. Yeah. Bray Wyatt is set on fire. Yeah. I'm assuming that scenario has happened at least once. Well, it, I'm sure it happens in a lot of, of, of households, probably a lot fewer than you'd want to be comfortable with, but yeah, I'm sure it does happen out there. I know that when we watch stuff with my kids, it's usually later on just because, well, I have kids, so I rarely get to watch things when they are on. But, <laughs> um, you know, we always say, like, you know, this part, we're going to skip this part or, or don't watch that part. Or we'll, we'll yeah. we try to let them choose, you know, and mm-hmm. say, like, this is what happens because if you kind of take that. You know, and be like, if you think you can make it through that, like, give it a shot. We'll turn it off whenever you want. Yeah. But be prepared. I remember one time, uh, just as a, a quick tangerine, the I was camping with my daughter and we were watching the show. She wanted to watch the show Alive, which is a show about people being dropped in the wilderness and they have to survive with only, like, their boot strings and hope. And... Uh, <laughs> So I said to her, because she was really into camping, I said to her, I was like, yes, we can watch this, no problem, you know, but I want you to know that there's a lot of animals that get killed because these guys have to hunt their own food and they show them like cooking and cleaning it. Like it's a, it's a very survivalist kind of thing. And she looked at me with like the most stern eyes and was like, dad, I don't have a problem with it if it's for food. <laughs> and I'm just like, all right. Hey, all like, right well, you, you thought know. about this then? Let's go watch. You the know you. <laughs> Let's go for it. So so yeah, when it comes to kids and content and stuff, you try to like prepare them, but in the end, you have to give them the ability to make the decision, or else they're just gonna see it as this like weird, marginalized thing that like you know it's why are you always obsessed with my forbidden closet of mystery? You know, it gives it all this reason for them to be into it and it draws them even closer. So maybe I should do that then, <laughs> and I could watch more wrestling. Well, yeah, because like, yeah, we'll for, me, <laughs> for me, I, I was super happy to see blood come back because I just think it adds to the match, right? Like Absolutely. It just adds to the drama of the match. The authenticity. Uh, you can't inauthentically bleed. Well, I mean, you can use fake blood and you, stuff, but, but they're blood. not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, like, there, there's little tricks that they do. Like, they'll, they'll yeah. take, like... um. 
blood not blood thinners but like if you take like an aspirin or some shit that, that'll make yeah blood, and uh, yeah. they always go for the forehead because the skin is so thin up here that it just a little yeah. nick will bleed like crazy you know the, yeah that kind of thing uh, and... i'm sure that cody is really happy with it because his dad bled like every match oh god his, his... his dad had a full abdullah the butcher forehead yeah, his um... dad bled giving a promo <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, the biggest bleeder in wrestling history is active right now, and that's John Moxley. True. Moxley's that... <laughs> theory is, look, this is a combat sport. You're going to bleed. And you're not just going to bleed in important matches. You're going to bleed in whatever matches, like, right? So, Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Sometimes, though, I, I do wonder if Mox thinks that this might be. Well, he might be taking the Ahmed Johnson train. Let's put it that way. In that he doesn't in, really, in he kind of oh, forgets okay. that it's fake. You know, I have a lot of respect for just how much John Moxley likes wrestling because mm. John Moxley, I, I mean, he has to be super rich. He was mm -hmm. WWE champion. He was earning WWE money for over a decade mm -hmm. and he's earning AEW money now. And, and getting high like, dollar bookings in Indies too. And then, um, well, yeah, for like for the longest time, it was like do a death match for in front of 50 people for GCW. Sure. That sounds like a good Saturday. I'll go do that. Yeah. It like, was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like, because I'm not I, I there's no way GCW was paying him his regular wage to go do that. They're, yeah. they're going to pay him what they can. So basically, Moxley, for all intents and purposes, just volunteered to go wrestle a death match. <laughs> I mean, like. What that doesn't happen to you? I uh, well, you know, you figure it's... after like twenty years of doing stuff, you might be like, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'll spend more time with my child. I think he spends a lot of time with the child, who is inevitably going to enjoy watching her father's career as she grows up. <laughs> but well, I think I think actually actually like since uh, since Renee gave birth, I, you don't really see Moxley in GCW as much, but. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. I think he's probably home a lot more than we realize, too, because he doesn't do a lot. Like, he does the AEW shows, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's not like he's working a WWE schedule. No, he's actually taking time off right now. He's, like, banged Good. up. But, <laughs> but he's going to do a couple of New Japan shows in April, so... Uh, oh, know, and, yeah. oh, never mind. Uh, he's going to Mexico City this weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember right. about yeah, that. So... <laughs> So, so there you go. On Friday, good, good job, John. C <laughs> on Friday, he's wrestling in Mexico City for CMLL. The Blackpool Combat Club is wrestling like Atlantis Jr. and uh, some other luchadors that are awesome. Vol uh, Volador <laughs> Jr. Um, and then on April 6th, he's wrestling Tatsuya Naito, possibly for the IWGP world title. And then he's doing something in Japan on the 13th. So this Getting guy sushi. enjoys wrestling quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And like, big, I guess he's of the mind hobby. that he might as well do it while he can. Yeah. I mean, I guess so. Like he's getting, you know, I mean, he's mid thirties now. Uh, I would have to imagine that he's going to be, he's going to slow down soon. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, well, he's got to move into that. He's sort of in his 1998 Mick Foley phase right now where he's just like, yeah, let's do it. And then Soon he'll move into his, well, that barbed wire two by four wasn't really on the level. And, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. So, or that, that um, cage gave way at a certain spot that was pretty predetermined, but that's well, okay. Not that I'm saying it should go any other way. Just, oh, I, I, I see. Like, because there's a big difference between the 1998 King of the Ring, uh, Hell in a Cell match. Yeah. And uh, whatever, was it the Royal Rumble? Whenever he had the retirement Hell in a Cell match mm. with Triple H, those well, that, two were very different. I think that was 2000. Yeah. And they'd had a Royal Rumble match that was like, he should have quit after that. It was, oh, it was right. brutal. Uh, and yeah. then they had the Hell in the Cell, I think at WrestleMania, yeah, to, to finish it off. No, I think it was actually at a pay-per-view between Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. Yeah. Because he, because the match was supposed to retire Cactus Jack, but then he came back as Mick Foley in the main event of WrestleMania that year. 
Mm. So it, that was that for was that the McMahon in every corner. Year? McMahon in every corner, which is Ugh. awful <laughs> to think about now. And then I, I didn't like it then. Uh, <laughs> it was not the greatest, but uh, hey, yeah, good for well, John Moxley. <laughs> yeah, good for John. I could definitely see John Moxley be like someone who's who's going to wrestle like full into their fifties. Um, yeah, but yeah. there was there was something else from Raw that I felt we should talk about. Um, so in between these rock segments, mm-hmm. we had another a rock and a rock place, if you will. <laughs> we had another segment that was very much a throwback to an older time in WWE. You know, we went through decades of the scripted promo right. and you've got wrestlers coming out, trying to deliver things line for line. Mm-hmm. You know, the best actors in the world are going to have trouble learning a script five minutes ago and then going out and delivering and it doing it in line. their underwear half the time. Yeah, there you go. So, and you know, before like Steve, like when Steve Austin and the rock were, were taking the business to new heights, uh, it was more like, okay, here's kind of what you yeah. want to say and where, you know, yep. get from point A to point B, you know, give me a general idea of what you think you're going to do in between. Yeah, And that's what this segment with Drew McIntyre and CM Punk and Seth Rollins was. So CM Punk comes out. He's in front of 15,000 people in Chicago who love the shit out of him. And uh, basic, the the point of the segment was to get to Punk being on commentary for Drew mm-hmm. McIntyre versus Seth Rollins at WrestleMania. But him and Drew McIntyre had this exchange that was just beautiful. <laughs> because you could tell that they were going off the cuff. And with CM Punk, there's always this little worry that he's yeah. going to say something that, you know, there's an element of danger almost when CM Punk has a live microphone. You're like, he could say something that uh, either gets him cheered, you know, or, or it could be another <laughs> Indies at a press conference situation. Uh <laughs> You know, there's just an element of danger going on yeah. here. And uh, so he's hitting Drew McIntyre with stuff. And at one point, Drew McIntyre refers to himself by his old nickname of the Chosen One. Mm-hmm. And if you remember, that nickname was given to him by none other than Vince McMahon. So yes. right after Drew McIntyre refers to himself as the Chosen One, CM Punk's like, and who get, who made you the Chosen One? Who yeah. chose you? What beacon of morality chose you? So he's dancing around the idea. I, I like, I couldn't believe it, but I also loved it yeah. because I'm, I'm real. I really think it's important for WWE fans to separate Vince McMahon and WWE. And so to hear basically Vince McMahon get shit upon on his own show, I loved it. I loved it. I love that that happened so much because it just solidified that asshole is gone. He has mm. nothing to do with this anymore. And um, I think yeah. the only people in wrestling that love those little inside baseball Easter eggs are mm-hmm. the Young Bucks. Mm-hmm. But CM Punk is a close second. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where where he sets himself apart is that he's able to weave them in sometimes in very subtle ways. Like we mm-hmm. all knew what he was getting at. Yes. He did, if he if he said Vince's name, it would have been, it would have ruined it. To be honest. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know? and, because, and probably yeah. would not have been good. Um, but that's why I say there's this element of danger with CM Punk. Yeah. Where like I'm listening to him, and I'm like, don't say anything that's gonna get you canceled. Don't say, like I'm like you just mm-hmm. get worried, right? Because he's on his last. This is his last chance. This is beyond his last chance. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so like, it's he just like can't oh help my himself. god. <laughs> like if he said something that got TKO uh, to be pissed off, that's it. His career's over. He's gonna end up in TNA. Which whatever, <laughs> fine. I'll watch him in TNA. <laughs> He could end up in ROH. No, wait, no one ends but like up the whole ROH. time he's dancing around this. Like I'm like trying to hold my TV screen. No, no. <laughs> uh, he was like, yeah, <laughs> it's like I'm being confined in some way. The will of 
some middle-aged man on edibles is preventing me from <laughs> going farther. And I'm straight edge. I can't do that. <laughs> Uh, but he never did. He never mm. went over the line, right? Like, and so I was reading some reports trying to find out if there was any heat on CM Punk for this. Nope. Apparently, yeah. PW Insider reported that there was like a hush while he was doing it. It was like, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, there was a hush backstage. I was like, there was a hush everywhere people were <laughs> witnessing it. There was a hush within me. <laughs> like there was a there was a hush externally from me and within me. My organs stopped while it was happening. Chad Gable's head exploded. <laughs> um but but yeah, like there was no like he he danced so close to the line, but he he never went over. And as he was doing that thing about who made you the chosen one, the camera cuts to Drew, and Drew McIntyre is like he has really won me over uh, as of late. I'm mm. the biggest Drew McIntyre fan. And he gave this look like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> but like having a laugh over it. <laughs> like there was a bit of a man. Like it was very much a um, nervous smile. He yeah. was giving him the old, this is funny, but I'm nervous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. And you know, and that adds so much to all of it too. Like, <laughs> You know, a little bit earlier, we talked about the authenticity of, of bleeding and, and things like that. And it's like every Vince, for some reason, he always saw Raw as a TV show and a TV show has to be yeah. scripted down to the minute. And it has to be this. And it has to be that. And I guess Vince has never seen a TV show where the people on it have fun <laughs> because there wasn't a lot of people having fun when that was the way for it to go. But. Now that there's a little bit of give and take, a little bit of play, a little bit of, and I wonder, you know, like, obviously there are miles of differences between Vince and Triple H, but the one thing Vince never did was have the benefit of knowing what it was like to be a wrestler in the yeah. ring. Yeah. And Triple H obviously does. So, you know, I think he might understand a little bit more than Vince ever did how important that stuff is. Mm -hmm. Not just to the, the fans, but to the wrestlers themselves, knowing that their contributions, like, you know, the, the, the downside of a scripted promo is that you feel like your talents aren't being used because what got you there was obviously your, your ability and your promo. Like, and it's also really hard. That... It's really hard to do it, scripted stuff. Yeah, exactly. Improv like you say, not everyone's than... an actor. Yeah. And so when you like it, it was that thing that wwe loved to do for the longest time where they loved to like take a successful wrestler and then just like hit the reset button wipe them clean and try to build yeah. a new wrestler. uh jeff me wrestling yes <laughs> are we supposed to go deeper than that i professional professional wrestling ah uh, yes not that amateur wrestling um, they don't even guess... have cool uniforms <laughs> um they're doing an interesting storyline with chad gable speaking of ah i'll tell you chad uh, gable is a uh a wrestler that the first time i saw him i was like i'm gonna hate this guy with a thousand passions till the day i die and <laughs> he won me over like within weeks He's so, fantastic. Good man. for him. When he, is... Yeah. When he was yeah, Jason like he Jordan's was always... tag partner in uh, uh, NXT. <laughs> yeah. He suffered uh, the hands of some interesting booking. Uh, if you remember, he was Shorty G. They referred to him yes. as Shorty G for a while. They sure did. Like, that's, uh, I mean. Backstage Talk Chaz about playing going, into the Ooh. guy's uh, strengths, you know, pointing out that he's short. And uh, his name is G. But he's involved with a really interesting storyline right now with mm -hmm. Sami Zayn and Gunther on Raw. Yeah. So back on uh, two weeks ago, it was the March 11th Raw. I, the main event was a gauntlet with the winner earning the Intercontinental title match against Gunther at WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did a good job of, of kind of building up why everyone in the match wanted to win it, but it, they it seemed like the story was focused on mm -hmm. Chad Gable 
And because yeah. Gable had talked about how when he lost to Gunther back in September, his daughter was ringside and she burst into tears. So it's like, oh, okay, the well, so it's going to be Gable. Too. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so it's going to be Gable versus Gunther at WrestleMania again. Yeah. Maybe and Gable Sammy's will win too. Yeah, yeah, like maybe Gable will be the guy to to beat uh, yeah. Gunther. And Sami Zayn had this storyline going into the match where, you know, he's trying to find a path to WrestleMania. And he's done these interviews about how, you know, a, a year ago I was wrestling Roman Reigns for the title at Elimination Chamber and I was this close. Mm -hmm. but I, I, I couldn't get it done. I need to prove to people that I can be a world champion. So he's sort of going through this period where it feels like he's losing confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know so what it, it sounds it like? If I may, mm -hmm. just for a second, it sounds like the beginning of a very similar program to what he had in NXT, where he's he's just he's never been able to get the big one, and you know he's he's trying hard, but just always seems to come up a day late and a dollar short, you know, and that led to one of the most memorable That's NXT right. moments and matches of all time. So I'm That's right. I never even thought about that, but yeah, yeah that's. That appears to be yeah. what they're doing. Like Triple H is probably like, "Hey, this worked in NXT. Let's," uh, and that would have been NXT yeah. before the USA Network, right? So it's like, yeah, oh, whatever. Like let's, full let's, sale let's, NXT. Yeah, yeah. Put it on on TV now. Um, so like, so kind of cool. But then Sami Zayn actually won that gauntlet match, mm -hmm. and he would uh, you know, beat Chad Gable with the pinning combination. So, so I was like, oh, okay. It seemed like they were going the Chad Gable route with that. But now mm. Sami Zayn won it. And we've seen these interactions between Gable and Zayn now the last couple of weeks where uh, Gable is sort of giving Sami Zayn advice. Yeah. Where, like, Gable had told Sami that he doesn't think he can beat Gunther. He's like, you can't beat Gunther. And then this week he was saying, like, Gunther, Gunther will make you doubt yourself. And now you're doubting mm. yourself. You know? And like, no, Chad, that was you. So all these little things were like Gable and Zayn. It's clear, like, all right, maybe there was some conflict, but they respect each other now. And then Sami Zayn wrestled Bronson Reed on Raw. And this is one of those matches where it's like, okay, Sami Zayn is an Intercontinental title match coming up at WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. Bronson Reed is nothing coming up at WrestleMania. Traditional booking is <laughs> that Sami Zayn is going to beat Bronson Reed every time, unless you're Vince Russo and you just yeah. don't know what you're doing. And then the match doesn't end anyways, because it's full of snakes. <laughs> we don't know why. Uh, Buff Bagwell's mother shows up and she's yeah. on a pole, something like that. Uh, but that's not what this was. This made sense. So Bronson Reed beat Sami Zayn. There was a distraction finish. Sami got, you know, whatever. And, uh, and Bronson Reed pinned him. So normally you would never do this. Yeah. Uh, but I thought it was very cool because if this was a real sport, this would happen sometimes, right? Like but people if, would lose. Yes. People would lose matches even when they've already gotten bigger matches scheduled. Cause that's the thing. If you look at a wrestler's winning percentage, mm. when they have a big match coming up and the other guy doesn't have a big match coming up, it's pretty much 100%. Except for uh, in cases yeah. of Vince Russo or this thing here with Bronson Reed. But in the story, it made so much sense because Sami Zayn is doubting himself. And then he went to the back and Gable basically said, you're doubting yourself and I can help. And then mm. they walked off somewhere and I assume, you know, this is going to be went to the library Sammy's arc. Some He's going to. He's gonna, yeah, he's gonna learn something from Chad Gable. Or he's, I, what was your joke? I didn't hear it. Oh, I said, she said they, they left and they went somewhere. And I said to the library to get books. Maybe, maybe they <laughs> went out and got some books on catch, uh, catches, catch can wrestling and stuff <laughs> like that. Entirely possible. Film the vignettes. Show us next week on Raw. I bet it happened. Bro, cha uh, <laughs> So it was this thing where. They did something that normally never happens. So now all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, well now it's not an automatic win for someone. So it makes things mm. a little bit less predictable. Um, also, I like Bronson Reed. He's cool. I, he needed a win. So he got that, but it also plays into this uh, plays into the storyline. Well, so I, I don't know. I just thought that that was really well mm -hmm. done on, on raw this week. Raw was just 
friggin' it was great. Good. It was good. It was really, really good. I'll say this about the Sammy Gunther thing. The only thing that I don't really like about it mm-hmm. is that it pretty much telegraphs that Gunther's gonna win. Because Sammy's this this story you're telling with Sammy needs to go past WrestleMania. Like it's not yeah. just gonna be a, a, a three or four week thing. So he's gotta lose at WrestleMania. That's gotta be something that sticks in his craw for the next however long. Be like, oh, I mm-hmm. lost, you know. Whereas if it was Chad Gable and Gunther, then I think there's more of a like, well, maybe Gable could do this somehow. It's WrestleMania, like anything can happen, you know? Mm-hmm. And and that's the only thing that I, I kind of don't like about it. Now that said. Next week, Chad Gable could turn on Sami Zayn, break his leg, and take his place in the match. I don't know. That's like, possible. Like I, you know, anything it, is, it possible. is possible. Gable could go heel. I don't think it's possible. Sami mm-hmm. Zayn would go heel. That just doesn't. Yeah. Uh, no. Or they could like something they would do. Just have a three way. You know, it it could be all kinds of of things. Like things can still change in that story leading up to uh, to where we're going. Um, it could but, also but, be. It could also be Rocky. Four? Yes, it could be Rocky Four. So this is like Gable is taken, you know, Gable and Sami Zayn are allies, and then Zayn goes into WrestleMania and Gunther just kills him. Not like Drago kills Apollo, because mm-hmm. Sami needs to still be alive for future things. Agreed. But uh basically just like destroy him in the match. Mm-hmm. And Sammy will go away for a while. He'll come back with some reason why he can whatever. Walk but then again. Gable goes and avenges Sammy, and they have Gable versus Gunther uh, somewhere down the line. But yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't, and you know what? I'd love yeah. to see that too. It'd be great. Yeah. Be great. But it's interesting. Like, what? How do you think Gunther's end or Gunther's reign ends? Um, well, that's the thing, and I think we talked about this a few weeks ago too, where it's like you're getting to that Roman Reigns point where it's like, all right, yeah. who is big enough to actually do this? Yeah, you know, and it's it's really cool that he's had this super long reign, and I feel like there there might still be some juice left in it too, but you know, it's not like people are clamoring for a title change or anything like that. But you know, mm-hmm. storyline wise, it's kind of one of those rare things where we can have our cake and eat it too as fans, because if Gunther's streak continues, awesome. Mm -hmm. If Gunther's streak doesn't, well, that's interesting, you know, Mm -hmm. like, and so there's no one that I can think of on the roster who really would upset that apple cart, except perhaps that Chad Gable kind of underdog story. Um, But I think you could uh, do Chad. I think you could do Chad Gable. Um, I don't think it works as well with Sami Zayn, I think the the yeah. personal stories with Chad Gable. I think one option that I heard a lot of fans uh, talk about is him doing the Ultimate Warrior uh, and going no, title for match title. Would suck. <laughs> well, oh, no, sorry, uh, doing the... <laughs> no, but uh, when Ultimate Warrior was the Intercontinental yeah. Champion and then went on to wrestle Hogan WrestleMania for WrestleMania seeks in the Sky yeah. Dome. Um, cause there's one, cause you've got two, two things, right? You've got an undefeated Gunther and an intercontinental title reign. And, um, mm-hmm. I don't like, I mean, obviously like you're going to lose both at the same time and, uh, unless and you I don't mean, do title for title. I don't it's know. not like there isn't press precedent either. Like look at Oscar's NXT women's championship reign where they were just like, well, we're out of people, so she's just gonna go, <laughs> and we're gonna have a tournament next week. <laughs> you know, and well, like, but there is this idea. So she's, though, she's that, the best, like, I guess. You know, unlike with Roman, you know, Roman is the world champion. There's nowhere else to go. Yeah. Gunther has another place to go, going after the world title. So, and in the case of Asuka and the women's title run, like, yeah, it's the NXT women's title, but she was going up to the main roster. So why not keep this um, aura of invincibility to her? Exactly. They could take that, that caveat and really just never mention it again or use it in any way whatsoever to further her character. (laughs) Wow. You know, that would be, (laughs) that, you know, makes sense. (laughs) But honestly, um, like, like how, what other call up has that ever happened for? You know, anyone else, even the champion, the heavyweight champion of the world in NXT, would drop the belt before moving up. But with Oscar, they were just like, "You're too damn good." 
Just go. Yeah, that's that's true. They normally you can't play do here it, anymore. They normally do it like NXT is a separate territory that like you have to drop the belt before going up. Mm-hmm. But like in my opinion, because it's a developmental brand, they should do it where like if you're champion for so long, they're like, okay, well now you're on Raw. Yeah. Um, but I guess that would make NXT feel a little bit too minor league, despite the fact that it is minor league. Mm-hmm. Like it, like it is. It's a developmental it is, territory. You know, a developmental yeah. territory, right? But you know they're on the CW network, not just the app. We so said, I don't know. I don't yeah, know I don't. a single human being that has either of those things. So, <laughs> well, for us, it's on Sportsnet. It's much yeah. easier to find. <laughs> I see. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, speaking of things on TV, though, I actually I'm glad we have a few minutes here because I wanted to talk about something. Um, so, you know, that 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 dark side of the ring show. Yeah. And you know how when it first started out, we were all like, wow, this is this is interesting. These are some really yeah. compelling stories and 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 things like that. And we were like, this is great. This should continue more of this, please. And then mm-hmm. at some point they just ran out of stories to tell. And, yeah, and now well... every episode of the show seems to just be like. This guy was a wrestler you remember, and everyone kind of liked him, but then he got sick and died. And this guy was a wrestler you remember, but he was kind of an asshole, so no one really liked him. But now he's doing better. Yeah, that's And then the there thing. was this guy that got cancer and died, and it wasn't until afterwards that we found out that everyone liked him. And I was like, what is this? Like... I don't understand. That's been, going, that's been going on for a while. The first time where I had an issue with that trend with Dark Side of the Ring, Ring was the Junkyard Dog episode. Yeah. It was like, like they were just trying too hard to put a negative spin on. Like, obviously, the, you know, the guy died yeah. before his time, but he died in a car accident, right? Like, um, you know, yeah. it's like, okay, well, he had some problem with drugs. Okay, name a wrestler who didn't, especially from that era. <laughs> Um, and so I just felt like that they were, they were trying too hard to put a, a negative, uh, slant on a guy who made tremendous mm. contributions to the wrestling industry and was very popular. Like junkyard yeah. dog was so popular in the territories before like Vince McMahon came in or whatever. Like he was so mm. big in mid South. Like I'm watching him on mid South from 1983 right now. And he's awesome. Everybody just, just, just loves it when he watch. comes in and he doesn't do much. He just dances around to, to music and headbutts a guy and does a power slam and that's it, you know? <laughs> uh, and everybody has a good time. What else do you need? But they were trying to play it up that, uh, that, Oh, he didn't, he wasn't as successful when he got to the WWE. And isn't that a yeah. shame? It's like, he was like the number three baby face. He was there. I'm sure he made yeah. a, a lot of money. And, uh, you know, his career, like, you know, he got out of shape when he was uh, getting a little bit older mm-hmm. as that happened. So like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I just felt that they were, that, that uh, they had to stretch to yeah. find a, a dark side to the junkyard dog's career. When I think a much better documentary would have been like, here's how awesome junkyard dog was in 1983 mm-hmm. mid South. Uh, you know, he made a, a very, racist bill watts say nice things about him and, yeah uh, you know so I don't yeah know, it, man. It, it i agree and i think that it after that plane ride from hell episode yeah that got everyone in so much trouble mm-hmm. um the people i think that are willing to participate yeah dropped significantly yeah that's absolutely true and yeah. so now they're like you know, the best we can do is Buff Bagwell, whose story yeah, translates you know. into I was a really rich kid and then I decided to be a wrestler and then I got hooked on painkillers and I had one bad match in WWE and got fired for it and now I do less painkillers. And this yeah. isn't to say that, and I'm not trying to minimize Buff Bagwell's struggles mm-hmm. or, or anything like that. But in terms of like what the show was supposed to be about, this dark side of the ring, these these legends, you know, like tell me what happened to Dino Bravo, you know, and like what was this particular scandal, you know, stuff that's like deep into the lore. This is just kind of like, you know, it's it's like it's like Inside Edition, 
You know? Yeah. Like no offense to buff Bagwell and there actually should be absolutely none uh, uh, taken in this, but like his story isn't dark enough for dark side of the ring. Right. Like yeah. he's alive and not in jail. I this like, <laughs> so, you know, um, and like, but I, and, and it gets, but it gets embarrassing. You know what I mean? Like they did this big segment on the the John Tenta one about how he like lost all his money and had to go work retail. And this it's like this isn't there's nothing productive or entertaining about telling me this. You know what yeah. I mean? Like this mm-hmm. doesn't make me feel like I I'm less sad John Tenta has died because I am. And I'm sorry that he went through those those hard times, but like like you say, it's not like dark. It's just kind of like, man, yeah, that happened to my neighbor a few years ago. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's something that you might say, like, did you hear about so and so? Um, but yeah, John Tenta, that like, yeah, that's another one. And I didn't watch the John Tenta one because I didn't want the same thing with the junkyard dog experience, where it's like, like this is like, yes, I watched it because I he didn't know early. a lot about Tenta's career outside of WWE WCW. So I watched. Yeah, I can't. I can't say I know much about it either. But like, I really enjoyed John Tenta, and I will give you. I want to tell this first story about when John Tenta debuted in WWE because it was really cool. Um, so this was in the '80s, and Ravishing Rick Rude is doing some segment where, um, he's ravishing. Uh, yeah, he's ravishing or whatever. God, how did this go? Anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to tell this great, but he was planted in the, in the, in the stands. Right. It was one of these cunt that was in the, uh, the, the Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was, he was planted in the stands. I think it was like, it was either a strong man thing or like, yeah. Yeah. Didn't rude have like a slam that he did or something like that. And it's like, if you can, if I can do that to this guy, he gets off a hundred dollars or something. Yeah, something like something like that. Um, yeah, and he was a plant in the fans, and then he attacked uh, someone that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, he also did. They talk at all about when he killed Damien? Yes. Oh, he did. I, Jake, that Jake, traumatized Jake. me. He squashed yeah. Jake the Snake Roberts' snake. My he God, did. he did. Yes, he, and the, uh, Jake is actually one of the primary interviews in the. The, the episode so i would listen to jake roberts talk about wrestling for days like just oh yeah you know and not in that weird rambly way when he's on crack but like actually <laughs> talking about it yeah the guy yeah his, he's so his passionate promos about. there are so many classic jake roberts promos but the best one has to be that one year at wrestlemania he cut the promo to ted dibiase mm-hmm. um talking about like you know, won't it, you know, in the end, it'll be you groveling for that very, you know, money, money. that was once yours. Like, just yeah. so, like, every, in an era when everybody else was screaming, he was whispering the darkest, most morbid shit. Yeah. It was awesome. He was, um, fan- I, and the only person I think that ever matched him intensity wise would be some of the Macho Man's finer work. Uh, yeah. Just in terms of yeah. like the intensity, you know, like, but Jake was so he was like a snake. He was slow, calculating, and then he would strike, and then yeah. he'd recoil. You know, and he, oh, he was so good. He was so good. Like he, yeah, Jake you know Roberts, fu- does not deserve the things that happened to him. Oh yeah. And I'm so glad that he's the one that that kind of made it out. You know, at least as much as he has. You yeah, know? you know, I, I obviously I don't believe Jake Roberts is a perfect human being. No, um, no one is, but. Certainly yeah. the, the situation he was born into was God. I mean, the Grizzly Smith episode. Good Lord. Good God damn. Or See, stuff um, like that. That is dark. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know? Jim Ross, uh, he dedicates an episode of his uh, podcast to his time in mid South. And he, yeah. And he talks about Grizzly Smith and just, uh, just yeah. awful, awful, awful. And if awful you can stuff. get through conrad thompson in that episode then you'll have done something my friend because uh, that guy really needs to stick to mortgages or whatever it is he does oh wow shots fired at conrad. i'm sorry he's not a good like talker 
Half the time, I don't. It sounds like he's looking at his phone. You know, like it just is he. But the anyway. amount of podcasts he does, he might like. He might just be like totally that done was with podcast. Blew me away. I'm like, you have 50 <laughs> podcasts. How are you not better at this? <laughs> um. Oh, so just on the Jake Jake Roberts thing, there was a couple of things I wanted to say about him. Um, I really like, uh, well, one thing about getting older that is actually not terrible is you can't like getting to getting to see new generations come up and what they're influenced by their Pepsi, and, if you will. <laughs> sure. A um, taste of a new generation. But I almost see like little Jake Roberts's have grown throughout wrestling. Right. Like people that you could tell were very influenced by how he cuts promos mm. and, and things like that. Raven strikes me as someone who is very much a Jake Roberts guy. And then you go a few years later and Bray Wyatt is very Wyatt. much a Jake Roberts and Dean a Raven Ambrose. guy. Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose very much. Uh, yeah. So um, who are some other little Jake Roberts is out there. It's difficult. Well, because, I like I like, like that he's with Vincent and Dutch now. If you've seen yeah. Vincent and Dutch or like, and they were on Ring the Ring of Honor a couple weeks ago. Yeah, and Jake I actually Roberts really like those punched guys. a guy out. Yeah, so, you know, he got involved. That was his ROH debut, by the way. Jake Roberts on ROH. Wow. Yeah, man. It's, um, it's, but yeah, I remember when when John Tenta squished his snake. That was a traumatic moment. Ed, traumatic. But you know what? Like that. That was so Jake Roberts was really the birth of that edgy like character that kids were kind of afraid of, but fascinated by. Yeah. You know, yeah. This was, this oh, was still when, when he like, got evil, you know, and when the undertaker is still wearing like purple gloves and looking like a zombie and stuff like that, yeah. you know, he's not filling that role yet. He's still kind of yeah. cartoonified. Jake Roberts was there before that. He really like, he knew the psychology of it all. It's Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do like because early in Undertaker's career, he worked a lot with Jake Roberts, like mm. his career as Undertaker. Um, yeah. yeah. When well, Undertaker he wasn't cutting went, promos then. Uh, Undertaker? No, no, no. Yeah. Paul Bearer would act all scared. Yeah! But yeah, like you could have Jake Roberts cutting a promo for Undertaker and Undertaker's feud with Warrior. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that works. But around that time when Jake went really evil, um, the famous one is when he had the Cobra bite macho mm. man. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that was such an epic moment. That was uh, like, you learn later that what was really happening was Jake couldn't get the snake off. him. Like I yeah. thought, Oh my God, how did they make this happen? How were they? Cause like, this is the eighties. We know it's, it, it's a show. Yeah. It's not real. But we don't know how they do anything. So you're sitting there going, like, it must have been a motorized snake. <laughs> and then kids at school would be like, no, it was, it was, you could see that it it was a real snake. Like, uh, you know, I once you got, just, in a, <laughs> got in a fist fight with a kid defending the loathing between Macho Man and Hulk Hogan after they'd been rumored to be seen riding motorcycles together. Oh, wow. Well, they always had an on again, off again relationship. Mm -hmm, true. Friendship. It was Friendship. definitely off at this point, though. The uh. big one was uh, Jim Duggan and Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah. So they had been like vicious enemies for the long. Or, no, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, it was Iron Sheik and Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Yes. And so they had been uh, rivals for the longest time. Um, and. It's really funny because I heard Hacksaw tell the story. I'll tell it from Hacksaw's perspective first. Basically, Hacksaw was like just trying to rent a car, trying to go to whatever. And I and Iron Sheik came out and was like, hey, Baba, hey, you know. We, it's, but like in that day, you were not supposed to, to like good guys and bad yeah. guys were not supposed to be seen in public, right? Let alone someone who had been your enemy for so long. So Axel was like, no, nah, like we can't do that or, or whatever. But Iron Sheik basically forced his way into the thing. Then they get pulled over. He's got cocaine on him. And, uh, yeah. you know, As of course. Style of time. <laughs> so this was a big scandal, of course, you know, and uh, 
you know, because it basically proved that wrestling was a show and everybody knew it was a show, but you know, it was a big scandal at the time still. And I remember at the time I was like, wow, they're both going to be in like, you know, super bad trouble. And like later you learn, like probably everyone was like, yeah, that was all chic. That was chic. (laughs) Chic is 100% at fault for all of that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, hating Jim Duggan would be like hating Labrador Retrievers. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, oh, man, kind I of am awful person. Are you? If you, yeah. <laughs> um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm watching 1983 Mid South right now because mm-hmm. um, I'm a fan of professional wrestling. I, uh, There's I watch just it not enough wrestling in the day. I guess it's not enough. No, but I, I, well, I actually like, I don't know, I enjoy watching wrestling from different eras, like. It's just, yeah. Um, but it's sort of the genesis of Hacksaw Jim Duggan is what I'm watching right now. It's kind of like how how a lot of middle-aged guys go through their World War II phase. They're just (laughs) exclusively watching documentaries about World War II for whatever reason. It's just, it's just a phase we all go through. Yours is like historical wrestling. Historical wrestling. I actually, I find it relaxing. Like sometimes I put it on before bed, like, you know, everything's slower in the eighties, right? You know, the dulcet tones of a young Jim Ross lulling you to sleep. (laughs) Yeah. Jim Ross, Jim Ross is on there. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's uh, anyway, so Jim Duggan came in and he was part of a group with Ted DiBiase and Matt Bourne, who would later become Doink the Clown. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all three of these guys, they were serious wrestlers back then. They'd turn into the most ridiculous gimmicks when they got to WWE. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the genesis of Duggan's babyface turn, because he was a heel, is that uh, Ted DiBiase was uh, doing business with, uh, oh, 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 I can't remember the manager's name. Um, but anyway... So Duggan has just turned baby face aligned with the good guys mm-hmm. and uh, has just started using the two by four. Ooh. The yes. The two by watching four. the, I'm watching the birth of the two by the four. Genesis. Yeah. The, <laughs> um, the mid South stuff. If, if anyone, you know, I know we've read it, but if anyone out there hasn't, if you read Jim Ross's two books, yeah. Um, both of them, he speaks extensively about his time. Um, in, in mid South and how he got started in wrestling and, and, you know, coming up in that era and stuff like that. And it, it's fascinating stuff. And then he talks about his WWE time, which didn't sound like it was any fun at all. No, that makes me I... sad, but. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it makes me really angry how Vince McMahon treated Jim Ross. Um, just uh, some of the things that were in that book, I was like, he just uh, like Vince mm. McMahon just seemed to take pleasure in picking on Jim Ross this guy who has made such positive contributions uh, to wrestling. Like, I don't know. It really bothered me. Some of the stories I heard about how Vince treated uh, uh, Jim Ross and where it's like this scenario where it's like, like I wouldn't be able to work under those conditions. Yeah. If that's what my boss is saying to me every day. So, uh, you know, well, this is old numerous... news now, but Vince McMahon is not a good person. No, he's not a great dude. No, no. But, uh, you know, and and throughout the books, you realize sort of what a sensitive kind of soul Jim Jim Ross is, and you yeah. don't really expect it from this, you know, down home Oki, but like, it it it's quite surprising when you read mm-hmm. like just how many times he's like, and then I went home and cried, you know, and it's yeah. like, oh my god, Jim Ross cried, my god. or had chocolate cake, his many yeah. uh, his many comments about chocolate cake, but yeah, I would have to say his books are an absolute must for any wrestling fan because you go through the history from 1983 all the way Mm. up until now. So when, when history stops and becomes present, um, yes. And he's got a new book coming out, uh, in May. Oh, I think it's May 7th, something like that. It's a slobber knocker Two, slobber harder. (laughs) I can't remember what it's called, but it's like the tagline is something like, uh, 50 years, 50 incredible calls, and it's on his 50 okay. years in wrestling. Just crazy when you think of it, because he's like 72, got started, you know. He's, so he's oh, he's like a teenager. Been in wrestling 50 years. When, yeah. Yeah, when he started driving guys around, that was his thing. He had a car, so he, so he drove people. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, man, Triple H took over WWE initially by driving people. Mm-hmm. That was how he became. he got in good with the click. 
if you i can't remember what book i read this in but the story is when he got to wwe he walked right up to the click sean michaels mm -hmm. diesel uh you know sean waltman was like i hear you are the guys i want to hang out with and yeah. then he became their driver and triple h is straight edge right like he doesn't drink yeah. doesn't do drugs the other guys whatever the opposite of straight edge is <laughs> was kind of what they were doing at the time so they needed a driver Triple H gets in guy in good with guys who <laughs> are uh, good with Vince McMahon. He yeah. gets in good with Vince McMahon, gets in real good with Stephanie McMahon, has Vince McMahon's grandchildren, now runs the company. So uh, volunteer step, to drive profit. for people. Yeah. <laughs> Next step, profit. <laughs> that was quite the recap of Triple H's career. <laughs> you, hey, you man, didn't... it. Triple H's rise to the to the top is a very interesting story in wrestling. And he told you all he was doing it the entire time in his theme songs. It's like <laughs> it's all about the game and how you play it. Mother, you just married the boss's daughter. Like, <laughs> I know what you're doing. He <laughs> this is where he is right now, is the culmination of a whole bunch of different steps he took. He was like, yeah. oh, I see. I can get in the, like, this is a family business. The very top of this business is going to a family member. I can, I can marry this fan, you know? Well, also um, I'm, I'm pretty sure he, he loved her. Sure. That's great too. <laughs> I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I like those two enough that I'm like, I, and I've seen them on enough, like, you know, fun yeah, yeah, Jimmy yeah. Fallon uh, segments uh, where, where I think they do care about each other. And I really, I can't lose that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just I, I can't hear me out here. I absolutely <laughs> believe that they do. But I believe Triple H would have anyway. That's all. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. And I'm not mad. In fact, I'm glad because he's really good in the role that he's in. What he's doing now is so fantastic for wrestling that uh fans of his were just completely looking past the fact that like he was ruthless in his rise to the top. He did it all. He went Absolutely. Game of Thrones style, man. Um, There's and... a lot of people that did not like him for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. He played the game. But like I said, it was all written in his theme songs. It's all about the game, how you play it. I'm the king of kings. All yeah, this what stuff about he that documented one? his entire rise to the top. Uh, playing the game, I get. Declaring yourself Jesus, I'm not sure. He's the king of kings. King of kings. Well, yes. no, because like when he started sitting on thrones and stuff like that. Also, to evolution me, that was is like... a mystery. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I like... just like that Triple H like knew Lemmy. Oh yeah, he yeah. spoke at his funeral. That's how close they were, and like Lemmy wrote those songs for Triple H to use coming to the like he knew those guys and he was uh you know I think that's super cool like he wasn't just like you know yeah this this band will be cool it fits my image or or these guys have an, an idea for a theme song for me and I'll use them because they're famous or whatever like like he knew those guys you know he, he likes stuff. that stuff Look at the stuff Triple H was able to do for himself like yeah be he's like I like Motorhead well I'll become good friends with Lemmy and Motorhead will do all my theme music. It's like, hmm, I really want a career in wrestling. Okay. I'll marry the boss's daughter and become the head of the wrestling company. Okay. Like I After like after a decades loved, long successful in ring career. Yeah, I, I will do the this Four horsemen. So I'll lead a group called evolution with Ric Flair, except for I'll be the friggin' champion. Like I'm sure <laughs> at some point he's just sat down and gone. I can do it. <laughs> he's homelander <laughs> <laughs> why are other people not just doing everything that they want <laughs> i did that and it seems huh. to have worked out fairly well um <laughs> yeah maybe this is the book that you need to write triple h is maybe uh yeah. a sense well, to the uh the throne you know See, I worry that we'll never get a Triple H biography because he's probably signed so many NDAs at this point that a true autobiography is just basically impossible at this point. Maybe. But, you know, yeah. if he writes it. Like... Look, I read The Rock's book, and it'd be better than that, so. 
I don't even know if The Rock has read The Rock's book. I don't think he has. <laughs> yeah, that was I, when The Rock's book came out. That was after Mick Foley's books had been yeah. incredibly successful. Mick Foley's books are also a must. Yes, if you haven't read those, definitely oh, yeah. read those. Basically, yeah, you get a good history of wrestling from like 85, like mid 80s mm-hmm. to, you know, all the way through until uh, he retired the, well, yeah. the main time. So, uh, yeah, Mick Foley's books were a classic. But that that was a big deal when Mick Foley's books were hitting the New York Times bestsellers. Then WWE was like, oh, money. And oh, we so, like that. Yes. But like Austin's book, The Rock's book, Hogan's book, uh oh, they were Shawn all... Michaels, everyone. Edge yeah. had a book. Like Yeah, but they were ghost written. Yeah. Um Whereas Mick did his all by hand. Mick did his uh, by hand. Um you can tell the difference between books that are like ghost written or not. A, a one that definitely is not and it's very good is John Moxley's book. Mm. um very cool if you're from toronto he dedicates like a couple of pages to how difficult it is to get around that streetcar stop at the coca-cola coliseum like like two paragraphs about like how frustrating (laughs) and confusing that turn is so it's very uh, confusing and frustrating (laughs) he has a whole chapter on toronto he talks about different wrestling cities that he loves his Um, wife is kind of from there you know his wife is from Toronto. Uh, definitely, you know, big roots in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, John Moxley's book I would definitely recommend as well. It's um, it's not like a restory, wrestling history lesson. You're just getting in a real mind, like getting really into the mind of John Moxley. Like he 